like to welcome Mark Littell to Very Interesting. Mark's a former major league pitcher, and he's kind of a local hero to a lot of us kids, which I'm not a kid anymore. And it's really a thrill and honor to have you here today on Very Interesting. Mark, welcome. Barry, thank you. And uh, I like your whole scene here. It's, well, thank uh, you. Very attractive, you know, the Boot Hills thing and red, white, and blue. The, that's what we're all about down here anyway. Well, Mark, I'm gonna gush over you for a minute. When I built this about two or three years ago, you were one of the guys on my list I wanted to interview on Very Interesting. So thank you. it kind of came about in a weird way, but uh, you're here. Well, I'm real glad to be here, and it's hard to get away from the boot hill. It's, you grow up here, it's a wonderful place. And I've been all over this country and a lot of places in the world, and I feel blessed that I was here. And uh, the people are great. I miss the food. <laughs> I'm in North Dakota at the time, but uh, hopefully I'll be back in Missouri soon. Um, I've been in Phoenix for 26 years because I coached 18 professionally with uh, four different organizations, Dodgers, Milwaukee, San Diego, and Kansas City. And then I've uh, I coached four different years in Australia. Uh, I've been to Cuba three different times recently, actually. Uh, and then uh, Puerto Rico, Panama, Dominican. You, th you, you throw all those in, you know, it's, uh, that's a lot of beans and rice. Well, Mark, since you're back home, tell us what it was like growing up in the 50s and 60s here in the Boot Hill. Some people think you're from Tallapoosa, some people think you're from Wardell, some people think you're from Gideon. Mm. Your claim to fame's Peach Orchard, though, so well, tell, us, right. tell us what right. it was like growing up here. Well, a lot of people will say, oh, you grew up in Cape Girardeau. I said, no, I was born in Cape Girardeau. Uh, my mom was a nurse. My dad uh, got shot up pretty good over in the Korean War, and he was always in the farming. And so he was a sharecropper down in Peach Orchard, uh, out to the south side of Peach Orchard. And uh, that's pretty much all we knew. And, uh, you know, there's nothing out there, really. You know, you got floodways and water moccasins and mosquitoes, and that's about it. Hasn't changed much, has it? No, it's pretty much the same. And uh, they got a little more rice now down there. But pretty much soybeans and cotton and winter wheat, uh, maybe a little bit Milo back then. But uh, all interesting as far as the people, the lifestyle, uh, there was you know, nothing given to you. You had to work for it. And uh, my parents, uh, I think parenting is a major big deal. It really is uh, how you're brought about and brought up. And it's okay to be tough. You know, and uh, hopefully they listen to you and, you know, you can put it back into play and, you know, they have timeouts or take the Xboxes away now and, you know, we just got a pretty good piece of leather. And uh, that pretty much said, spoke volumes. Uh, that was a big deal. Well, that must have been a Tallapoosa thing because my mom and dad also liked the leather too. So that must be a Tallapoosa, Wardell, Peach Orchard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that Tallapoosa thing is my, grand, my mama Sally and my grandma Baker. And I had my great granddad and granddad, whole nine yards. They had that, that farm up there. I can't remember how many acres, around 120 maybe, something, something like that. And then my mama Sally, she was a church goer and she taught Bible school and uh, she taught the kids, and then I had Uncle Red and Aunt, Aunt Ida over there living on the other side of the ditch. I think it was number eight. I can't remember. But anyway, it, it, it's all the same. It's a boot hill. It's flat. It's, it's, it's the best soybean ground in the country, and New Madrid County is, you know, that great earthquake caused some really good things to happen down the line. Ice, ice cream farmland. This is the garden spot of the world right here. Exactly. You know, you've got the number two, uh, next, next to the Egyptian Delta, this is the largest drainage district in the, in the United States. I, I mean, call, the world, yeah, rather. I, I call it the eighth wonder of the world, our drainage it, system. It is. It is outstanding. I mean, they moved more dirt in, in uh, the Boot Hill of Missouri to clear it uh, than they did the Panama Canal. So they pulled a lot of those, that machinery that was just gonna rust down there up mm -hmm. to the boot hill of Missouri to get it drained out to where we could have those nice farm, that nice farm ground. So they sold all that off, get in Anderson Lumber Company. Long story about that, but actually it was started in Clarkton and then they moved it to Gideon. Uh, and Gideon was a very interesting place because it was uh, for a very short period, the largest 
school district in the United States. Really? And, yeah, it was uh, very interesting because they had so many people in the Gideon School District, 1900, if I'm not mistaken, then other, some other place took over really quick, within like three or four month period there. But you know, you, you had people just working cotton, soybeans, you had people working in logging, you had a nice school system, that school is still there, the same school my parents went to that I went to, the whole nine yards. I thought it was just absolutely. It was booming back then. then. It was just a boom town. And you know, they had just as many uh, churches as they did bars mm -hmm. and uh, the whole nine yards. The history is deep, it's thick. Uh, I even had an Aunt B. I mentioned it in my books, you know, about my Aunt B. And she was very legitimate Aunt B. You know, she had the gold tooth, glasses, and freckles, and she was the pillar of the Methodist church. So, and, you know, when you're Methodist in the Boo Hill, you're going to hell, basically. So, you got. You know, I didn't know that. The Baptist, the Pentecost <laughs> said, you know, you're going, because y'all got pool table and you can dance. <laughs> Well, Mark, how old were you when you started playing baseball? When did you realize that that, <clears throat> that was your thing, that was your niche? Well, you know, um, I was out there in the middle of nowhere. My dad, I played catch with him one time. He, he wore a brace because he, he got shot up pretty good and back leg, everything else. And he said to my mom, he, I threw a couple of balls to him and he was left-handed anyway and he had this brace on and it hit it, it, it jiggled him and he said, he said, Jeannie, my mom, I, I, can't, I can't handle this. So I played catch with my mom until my brother, who was a year and 16 days behind me, started catching me because I'd throw clods at him. So that's how I got my arm up to shape, I guess. And uh, so mom caught me until Eric got big enough. Eric uh, caught me in high school. He got drafted out of high school. He got drafted out of college. He went to Mississippi State. So we were kind of like the gruesome twosome. We'd go out there and uh, we had a lot of fun out on a baseball field, Eric and I. So you played baseball the whole way through Gideon in a small school? Yes. How was it when like Risco or Parmer, those kids got up against this big high school pitcher that was throwing 90 miles per hour? It was I mean, fun I'm for sure, me. I'm sure it was funny some days, right? It was fun for me. You know, and if you know, an umpire didn't call anything, Eric could shoot down a sign and he'd miss it and hit the umpire's mask, <laughs> and, you know, and it'd wake him up. and. He said, I'm a, he, he'd come up and he'd say, get right in my brother's face. I remember this. I got a story in here about it. He said, I'm going to kick you out. And Eric was, had his glove on and he said, you're not going to kick me out. He said, I'm the only guy that can catch him. <laughs> That's job security, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yep. So who was your big rival at Gideon back then? Who was the big team that you always uh, well, dreaded playing against? Because you couldn't pitch every game. No. We had North, North Penascot, and then uh, we had uh, Southland, which was Randy Smith was a left-hander, and Randy played for Blyville Legion, and then I played for Poplar Bluff. I played three years at Poplar Bluff. My last year was at Blyville because more scouts, we felt, could actually see me. Mm -hmm. You know, and, uh, it was, you had the interstate right there, and they, and, you know, they said, ah, let's go see Latell, and so, so they, I had some, some followings. And that actually, the Blyville deal actually paid off? Is that where the scouts found Yeah, you? I did. You know, I was a 12th round pick, which was interesting too. Uh, Gary Blaylock, who lives here in Malden, uh, signed me. Big baseball man, bigger than me. He really is. He's my hero. And he was with the Yankees, he played a little bit with the Cardinals for about a year. But he was the 85 uh, pitching coach for the World Series Royals. Yes. And what he had done for that organization and other organizations, he carries a lot of weight. He carries a very good name, very honorable person, extremely. My fight for him is he should be in the Hall, uh, Missouri Sports Hall of Fame, by the way. So I'm surprised. We still got time, so keep lobbying, yes, okay? Yes, yes, I'm going to. So I'm curious what you think about baseball players today. You know, even at Little League, they're doing pitch counts and all kinds of things like that that affects pitchers later on. Yeah. So how's that evolved from, I mean, you got your strength from throwing dirt clods. Now, you know, they're, they're pretty protective of the Little Leaguer, the pitchers and the Junior Babe Ruth League and the high school league. So mm -hmm. how's that evolved from dirt clods to limousines? 
Well, the thing is, is I threw dirt clods. I worked with my hands. I did change plow points. Uh, so our, my strength was a little bit different. I call it tensile strength. So our joints were kind of tied together pretty good. When you're working on Xbox, you're not doing too much. That's right. You know, uh, that's a danger zone. And so you're not going to be the tough, as tough as you really think you are. I don't mind pitch counts, to tell you the truth. I wish I had some pitch counts to, uh, I threw, statistically there's some stuff that I've done that is really funny. And I make, I make fun of myself in these books. Uh, Four scum statistics on that one and other things. But I think it's interesting that they, they should nowadays, but they, uh, they, they just do weight things, they go here, okay, okay, I worked out. Well, my, my thing was, my dad said, I want you to put those power points on. If it three hours, you did it. If it took five hours, you did it. You didn't, and, and you had to finish it. You know, it wasn't, oh, can I quit now? No, you have to finish this. So, uh, I like to always mention that I'm ADD, and I, got, I, I mentioned it in my books a little, bit and talk about it. And because when I was in school was if you ask somebody in Gideon, they'd say, what do you think of Mark Littell? Oh, he's a good looking guy. And you know, he's a pretty good athlete, real good athlete. I don't know about schoolwork though. You know, seems like he's, uh, he's counting the fins up there on that fan and everybody else watching the board, <laughs> you know? So, but anyway, I, uh, I took some of those smart pills and and uh, got straightened out and ended up writing books and I even invented the Nutty Buddy, a uh, protective cup, and I've won five awards on that and, and I'm an idiot, <laughs> so whatever. That's quite an invention. We're gonna get into that later. I, okay. Matter of fact, we may show a video clip of that later. Because oh yeah. You get a lot of publicity when that first launched, but we'll get into that later. So Mark, being from a small town, small school, what, what was it like being drafted back then? Because you know, there's a lot of bells and whistles and. ESPN on getting drafted nowadays, but just from an old country boy from Gideon, Missouri, what was it like getting drafted? Was there a lot of hoopla around you in the local area then? Uh, there was a little bit, but of course, you know, today we have the technology uh, of, you know, everything. We didn't have all that. We didn't have the cell phones and, hey, you gotta go over and see this. Hey, look at him and- Tweeting. Tweet and everything, mm -hmm. you know, of that. We have 330 million people versus 165, 170. When I was out there in, uh, in, the, in the 70, 71, 72, that, that era right there. So it was a little thinner, but we also had 26 major league teams. And uh, now we have 30. There, there was a little bit of a difference. As a matter of fact, I came up when there was 26 major league teams. I thought that was, I, it, it didn't bother me. And I didn't know the numbers, how hard it was to make the big leagues. The numbers were like 4% even when you drafted. I just always thought I was gonna be a big league player. And then uh, when I was drafted with the Royals 12th round and Gary asked me, he signed me, he said, Mark, uh, I was like to come out to Billings, Montana. I was actually supposed to go to Kingsport, Tennessee. I said, wow, that'd be great. Well, there was more, co that's college league. So there's about, four or five high school kids on that team, George Brett being one of those, a high school guy out of El, C El Segundo, California. So he pretty much parked his surfboard at the door and I parked my plow. So and let me get this straight, Mark. So Gary Blaylock from, I think he was from Clarkton or Malden, Missouri at the yes, time. Yes, yes. You and him hooked up yes. 1,400 miles away in Montana for yes. your first minor league gig, right? Yes, interesting. Did, did y'all know each other back then? No, no. Matter of fact, Gary was tough. I mean, I said, well, I'm not gonna get drafted by the Royals. This guy, he don't want you. He, he, he wasn't giving was any really, hometown favors, huh? Yeah, he was, he was tough. He, he was just testing me. He, he knew how to push the button on me, you know? I, I, matter of fact, I threw a no-hitter against North Pema Scott, and he came down and he said, why'd you throw that pitch to this guy in this inning? And I said, to get him out? <laughs> so anyway, or something like that. Uh, but anyway, so y'all didn't hit it off right No, off not at all. Matter of fact, he was tough. You know, when I went there, you're a little bit timid of Gary, but you know, you played ball and you know, all the California boys, they were out of UCLA, USC, University of Special Children, I told them. And then uh, 
uh, Irvine, everything. I mean, they were all over the place. So you and Gary hooked up there in Billings, Montana, 1,400 miles away from Malden. Yep. A lot of players just hover around in the minor leagues for years. Their whole career never make the big leagues. Right. You didn't really stay in the minor league very long. Two how, years. How old were you when you actually made your pitching debut? Another, another interesting story, I was 20. It was June 14th against Baltimore in Baltimore. And I didn't go to big league camp, which was another, <laughs> it's kind of like, where'd this Littell come from? Who pulled him out of the woodwork? Well, I was, wasn't, I was actually supposed to go to double A. So I worked out with double A for one day and John Sherholtz was the assistant farm director who was the general manager big time for Atlanta. And Lou Gorman was the farm director and they were always walking around and, and I was coming off the field and Lou said, country, he said, hey, you're always in shape. He said, how do you feel right now? I said, you know, he said, you think you could throw three innings for, for uh, our triple A team in Omaha? Uh, he said, we haven't got all the guys back down from the big leagues. They hadn't shuffled back. As a matter of fact, we haven't had anybody shuffle back. I said, yeah, yeah, I could throw for you, you know. <laughs> Would they expect you to say, no, no, no pass, was, pass yeah. me over this then? Yeah, and then, uh, I had worked in uh, instructional league with a visualization program with uh, Harrison Lee and Riley. And uh, I actually controlled and focused with the ADD. It wasn't the ADD, it was anybody. But what's gonna, what's gonna get me over the hump to get me to the big league level? Well, I had a good fastball. I had a pretty decent breaking ball. I had no change up really, but what, why do these guys go? Because you know they're around the plate and they put the ball in play and things of that nature. So I adapted to that and understood it and worked at it with them for over two months. So when I came in, and I used it uh, in the instructional league and everybody said, wow, you know, it was different. It's not that you're throwing harder, it's that you're actually pitching. You know, pitching and throwing have one thing in common. They have the same amount of letters in both words and that's where it stops. Yeah, that's pretty much the way you look at it. So instead of trying to strike everybody out, you kind of was more strategic about it. Exactly. Even though I hold a strikeout record for the Cardinals, uh, I hold to this day I hold a, a, for relievers. I hold a single season for uh, most strikeouts in uh, any single season. I thought that's pretty interesting because the Boot Hill Boy holds that record, and I hold yeah. a record. Interestingly, born in the state, played for both teams, but never played outside the state. That's another one. That's quite an accomplishment because, you know, there's many Cardinals fans around here. Yeah. And, you know, when the Cardinals aren't winning, we root for the Royals usually. So you get the best of both worlds. I do, without a doubt, without a doubt. So, Mark, you made the major leagues. Was that, was that a big pop in circumstance in southeast Missouri over that because you made it to one of our home teams? I don't know that. I, I, I was so uh, enthralled or so in tune of trying to pitch and be at the big league level. You know, it's, it's hard to make the big leagues, but it's harder to stay. So at that point in time, you weren't worried about how much cotton was getting picked down in Talapoose or Gideon? No, but you know, the fun thing was in, in Billings, Montana, not to backtrack too much here, but uh, I'd get my paper and it would talk about Miss Moomaw and Aunt B having these dinners over on Sunday. And so a guy, country, what do you got there? I said, my hometown paper. <laughs> and, you know, I said, hi, I'm Mark Patel. I'm from Gideon, Missouri. Where'd you say he was from again there, boy? <laughs> and so they said, where's he from? You know. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because you, you kind of took the country to the major leagues. I did. The, yeah. cult the culture in the major leagues. How did the country boy fit in with that? Well, you got a lot of California boys. You got a lot of Texas boys. You got actually a lot of New York and Michigan boys in Florida. You know, they're all from all over. And, uh, you know, I'm just pretty much myself. And, you know, I'd pretty much straight shooter and see it like it was. I didn't, I wish I wasn't a straight shooter all the time. But <laughs> that had to be some culture shock for other people and you because you took your set of morals and values from Southeast Missouri to the big leagues. So exactly. I'm sure that didn't mesh with everybody. No. It did not, and uh, but he, but, but the guy with the paper, he would get up. He said, "Hey, he, he stands paper. Hey, Miss Moomaw is going over to Aunt B's after church, and they're going to have four other girls over there to eat a Sunday dinner." 
It's going to have roast beef, mashed taters. So they, he was kind of making fun. Oh, yeah. They loved it, though. Yeah. All these guys. That, that was entertainment. All, yeah, it was entertainment. And then so the way I got my name, that was a very interesting. Joe Flash Gordon, who's a Hall of Famer, he was a hitting guy, and Spider Jorgensen, they were out there, and I was throwing BP, and I never threw BP before. <laughs> I never threw BP. And then they had this L screen. And so uh, this guy got on first base, and Blaylock, Blay, Gary, Gary yelled out, my, my name wasn't country then, but the next day it would be, Mark, he said, go out of the stretch. I said, oh, okay, okay. I mean, I'm all over the place, out of the windup, and these college guys are, oh, kind of a little mm -hmm. hungry. And I'm not, I didn't know how to throw bats. I'm just, I'm going to get you out. <laughs> you know? So you were really putting it to them then? Yeah, I'm going to get you, you out. Just, you weren't just letting them hit home runs? No. I didn't know, I, no, didn't any, know anything about throwing BP. And so anyway, he says, he says, he said, and he took what swings he could, and he went down to first base. And there's this guy named Dave Landris from UCLA that was first baseman. He was taking throws from Brett and some of the others, and you know, Cross and doing this. And when he said come to the set, and then the hitter, he took leads out there. He was getting leads and stuff like that. And I come set, and I said, well, hell, he gets a good, he gets a lead. I'm gonna pick his butt off. <laughs> in so, batting practice. In batting practice. And so I come set. I said, man, he's got a heck of a lead over there. And so Landers is getting a throw from the cross the diamond, and one's going right by his head for my pickoff. Wow. <laughs> he throws his glove down, empties his pants. Everybody's <laughs> on the ground in the outfield, the coaches, everybody but Blaylock. Damn it, country. I mean, damn it, Mark. He said, let's get this. And then the next day, Flash Gordon was on the ground, Spider was on the They were all rolling, you know. They'd never ever seen anything like this. I said, okay, okay. You know, so I got out of it. And uh, Landers comes back on the field after he comes into the training room and everything and uh, takes some more throws. But Flash Gordon says, he says, you know what? I, you know, we were coming out on the field before we were working out and stretching. He said, I kind of like that old country boy. He, 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 I like him. Hey, country, come here. So yeah, that's where I got the name. That's where the name was born. Joe Gordon. So they, they wanted you not to take betting practice so serious from then on, right? No. And then uh, the interesting thing is I got in, I don't know, 90-something something innings more than any other pitcher. I didn't pitch for about four or five days. And I asked Gary after the game, which got over at 9-something, we boarded the bus at 10.30. And we were going 16 or 17 hours to Caldwell, Idaho. I said, I said, hey, Gary, because he said, don't you ever call me coach again. And so I, I said, okay, call me Skip or Gary. And I said, okay, coach. And I said, Gary. And he, he, I said, we were out there by the bus loading it up and after the game and lights were still on. And I said, where are we going? He said, Caldwell, Idaho. I said, well, how far is that? It's 17 hours. He said, oh, okay. That'd be fun. And all the college boys were like, I know. <laughs> that was my first bus ride, 17 hours, Caldwell, Idaho. You got broke in well in 17 hours. Yeah, I sure did. Pretty amazing. You go through West Yellowstone, Montana, all the way across. Pretty well, in, in your career, you probably got to see almost every part of every state then. You went, you went through part of every state probably. Over. I, I went through a lot of states because playing, coaching, coaching especially. As a matter of fact, in, uh, I was up in Montana and we were out in Wyoming coming back and we hit a bull out in the middle of nowhere, took the bus down. It's a good story. It's in this one. We're, so, going to get in, we're going to get into your books, I <laughs> but I want to wrap your career, your baseball career up because we're going to get into future, yeah. present day and future things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. But you wound up 32 wins, 31 losses, ERA mm -hmm. of 3.32, which is really good, mm -hmm. 466 strikeouts and 56 saves. Mm -hmm. That is not a Hall of Fame career, but you're a Hall of Famer in Southeast Missouri, but you had a lot of iconic moments in Major League Baseball. Yeah. For example, Pete Rose. 
Right. He got a famous hit off of you. It was his right. record-breaking hit. He became the hit leader off of Mark Littell. And Stan was there that night in Philadelphia. Really? Yeah, because he wanted to follow him, and it was in the last game. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, uh, I threw a pitch. He broke his bat, and I said, if, if Ozzy can't get it, nobody's going to get it. And then uh, Gene Tennis was catching me, and he already had three World Series rings on from Oakland. And he said, he came out the mound. Of course, they're holding the ball game up for eight, ten minutes, and you know, Stan comes down and shakes his hand. All the Phillies are over there on first base. And Gino comes out to me, lifts his mask up. Way to go, big boy! You're in the record books. <laughs> <laughs> so. What was your favorite ballpark to pitch in besides <clears throat> Bush Stadium? Dodger Stadium. Why? I like, and I didn't mind pitching in the American League in Boston. That's a that's not a pitcher's park. But I did well there. And then uh, Dodger Stadium, I liked their mound. And uh, it was great. We had a great ground crew guy, George Toma. George Toma has done all, now, 55 Super Bowls. He's 93. Wow. He is the ground crew guy still for Kansas City. He needs to be in the Missouri Hall of Fame, too. He needs to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. He sounds like the, the he's, Major League he's, Baseball. He's incredible. Beautiful feels. So Mark, let's get into your book writing. You wrote three books. Yeah. One of them I think is fairly new, correct? Yes. So tell us about your three books. <clears throat> well, uh, seven years ago I started writing. I was actually afraid to write uh, because I'm ADD and I thought, hmm. But I started writing and I thought, hey, this kind of calms me. And so I, I, I sent four or five stories over to my partner with the Nutty Buddy and he really liked them. He said, did you write these? And I said, yeah. He said, how many of these you got? I said, 20 or so. He says, I want to back your book. I said, what do you mean you want to back my book? He said, I got friends and they're best sellers. They don't write like that. I said, really? He said, no, I'm not kidding you. And I said, well, okay. So anyway, uh, I came out with my first book on the eighth day God made baseball, you know, and so it, you had to write the baseball book first. Of course. Of course. I mean, I would have wanted to write this about the boot heel first, but you know, my characteristics and you know, life growing up and what formed Mark you know, with the family and, mm -hmm. and the boot heel and the people. And uh, you, you see a lot of things on a farm. You see a lot of things in a small town. So Mark, that's a good question. You had, you, you're, you're telling the audience you had ADD? Yes. When did you figure out that that was a term and you had it? I don't know. Uh, they, you know, they didn't know for a long time. At 46, I got tested. It didn't take actually very long for the guy. He said, yeah, you're top of the heap. <laughs> and I said, okay. That's not the award you were wanting to win that day, right? No, actually, it was because there's a lot of really intelligent ADD people that are CEOs. Mm -hmm. It's just that people can't stand them. <laughs> You know, you know, you know, and, you know, if they keep their mouth shut, do their job and tell them their creative idea once in a while, they're okay. But they, you can't do that. You've got to say, hey, you got to do this, this and this and this. You know, but you found out that becoming an author and writing books was kind of a therapy and calming. For it you. did. It slowed me down. And I enjoyed telling the good stories and, you know, using and being specific. I'm real specific, I guess. You know, and uh, I, uh, the one guy out of New York, he said, um, you really uh, take the word suspense and, and push it at the right times so for your stories. You got the suspense and it builds. And I said, because I, I'm writing about baseball through baseball, but I'm writing about more for life. Mm -hmm. And I write for women, actually. People say, really? Because if I can capture women's minds and, and be specific enough, and, why, and they're reading this and they're laughing, and they go, I've done my job, I did it. I, I, I did it. So your first book was On the Eighth Day God Made Baseball, is that yes, correct? Yes, right. How long did it take you to write that book? Not very long. Um, and that was about seven years ago? That you yeah, I just kind of slapped it out pretty good. And I, now I do have a person that edits. Uh, and then you have, you know, proofreaders. You've got to have proofreaders. Then your second book was? Country Boy, Conveniently Wild. And it's got the moccasin on it. And it's all boot heel stories. And, you know, the Memphis story or whatever. 
And uh, it, it, it's fun about, you know, cotton trailers and cotton, cotton trailer football. And, you know, of course, back then you play cotton trailer football, you might get a splinter the size of an arrow mm. right through your arm. That don't sound and, good. And you're pulling it out, you know, and okay, let's go. <laughs> so, so you get a new book, book number three that just come out. Yeah. How new is it? Uh, it's almost seven months, but... Uh, the name the, of the book is what? It's called What's Up Ramrod, with a question mark. It's uh, got the kangaroo on it. And the reason I have the kangaroo on this book is because these are coaching stories, and they're really fun. Uh, it's about my 18 years coaching with the organizations and going through that. Uh, I, I picked some fun times with each year. And then uh, I coached four years in Australia. I was the uh, coach in residence for the country for the bicentennial year. And so uh, I went over there and had a great time, learned a lot, uh, fun times. I hunted with the Aborigines. They took me uh, kangaroo hunting at night. Uh, you got a mishmash there, in a sense, black and white, because of, well, it was turn of century when they still were collecting a bounty. Mm -hmm. And they, I was working with their kids and also Australian kids in Port Hedland, which is on the end of the earth. It's an Indian Ocean up from Perth, 600 miles, 10,000 people, miners. And I was working and touching them, and this is the first time they really ever had a white guy touch them. And so at the wow. end, you had the whites over here and the blacks over here, and whites talked to me, and then the blacks hung around. They, they talked to me for 20 minutes or so and said, you always touch your kids like that? I said, well, I'm just trying to you know, show them the positioning. And they said, oh, okay. And I said, uh, and then there was some, really, uh, some other stuff. And there, one guy said, because I was hanging out with a reporter during the day, and he said, he was right behind me. And he said, what do you think? Uh, we, hear you like to, we hear you like to hunt because of reporters. What's he like to do? He likes to hunt. He said, he likes to hunt. So they came and said, we'd like to take you hunting tomorrow night after you get finished. So I went at nighttime with him in the uh, bush out there <clears throat> in Western Australia. And it was great. I took my, they were barefooted <clears throat> and I took my shoes off and went barefooted and it was so hot. I took my shirt off and so I was like them. It was fun. They they, let me, they, and they, they let me do all the shooting. That gave you a connection with them then. Oh, I connected. Nobody's ever really probably tried to have that connection. Right there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I mean, I, I run around barefoot and I said, this sand's really good. What if there's any uh, death adders in here? <laughs> so thought you were back in Tallapoosa, didn't you? Run around got, with your shirt off and yeah, barefoot. Oh, it was, it was wonderful. I loved it. I had a, and we got stuck in quicksand of all things that night. And they said, no worries. I said, really? And they said, you, you come out the back. It was dry, but the front end went like that, and I went, that's quicksand, huh? And I said, yep. Absolutely amazing to me, so, absolutely. Mark, I just purchased all three books. I purchased them for my two brothers and a friend of mine. Yes. And I can't wait to read them, because I know there's a million more stories in here about yes. the food hill, which, like I said, I'm anxious to read them. I'll have those books read quickly. So well, thank I'll give you. you a full book report I, I expect in, in that. the near future. I expect that, Barry. <laughs> So you figured out that you liked writing and you're good at it. What, your, what was your next step after you conquered book writing? Well, you know, I've got a fourth book, obviously. I'm kind of slapping it out. and <clears throat> Sometimes you got to back away from it to uh, get straightened out a little bit. <clears throat> In the meantime, I had a, a guy call me that had read it, my, all my books, and. He's, he went to Yale and Stanford and everything else. He's got a big old whoof. He's a lawyer for actors and producers. He said, he wants, he wants me to write a screenplay. And I said, he says, I know you can do that because I've read your books. And he said, I like your writing. And then he said, he said, this would be interesting for you to capture in a screenplay. And there's rules when you write a screenplay because it's anywhere from 110 to 120 pages. And you know, you have to follow it exactly, in a sense. You know, they're pretty picky, I guess, up there, and that's fine, you know, so. Sounds like there's a movie in the works. Yeah, it'd be fun, you know, if something came around, you know, you got um, a lot of stuff, you got Boot Hill Boy, Ain't Nothing But a Party. <laughs> you know, why not? And, I think it's a great idea for a movie. Well, it keeps me busy off the streets, too, so that's good. So Mark, before we come on the camera, you were telling me about you accidentally were working for the Cuban government. 
And that's, yeah. and that's kind of a, we're going to have a teaser for your fourth book. So yeah, I, can you give us a little teaser about how did you accidentally work for the Cuban government? Well, I was going to, uh, I, I was over there to do some stuff on a FIDE, which is where you have different countries uh, talk uh, in a symposium, basically. And so you've got your headphones set on and everybody's translating because there's different countries. And so when I got up there to speak, you know, you're sitting there uh, on pitching. They, and they gave me, which was really cool, because I was the only major leaguer there. And they gave me extra time. Matter of fact, I turned to the guy and he said, he went graciously. Yielded to the speaker. Yield. And so I kept, I kept talking. And, <clears throat> you know, I'd been over there two other times with one younger team and one college type of team. And, uh, you know, Cuba is a communist country. Uh, it's like China. Russia's different. Russia's more different. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that. But anyway, the whole thing about Cuba is people are thin. They still have a ration card over there. Uh, the only people that have any weight are administrators and government people. They eat a little bit better if they work for the they, government. They do. That's right. That's right. It is hot. Uh, Guantanamo Bay is at the other end over there. But they do love their baseball there, right? Oh, it's ridiculous. They're, they love baseball, and they're wonderful people. I, I really enjoyed them. And they're the same as us. They're trying, you know, to have a happy life and a family and, uh, and, and make everything work. But their baseball, yes, uh, uh, it was, there's a lot of ball players. Matter of fact, I had two college teams. After I got through coaching, I did some amateur stuff. Uh, I had some kids from anywhere from 11 and up, mostly older teams. But then I had two college teams for four years that I had under Team Nutty Buddy. So it was a summer college team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I enjoyed working, kept keeping my foot in the door with those guys. Baseball's been your whole life, your whole it has. life. It's all, I, it's all I do. And, and I enjoy it. I enjoy people. I enjoy people a lot. Because... Uh, Everybody's got issues, and you hear their issues, and they hear mine. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Nine out of ten days, uh, my players, they're, they're going to be on, you know, and one day their girlfriend or parent or whatever, and then I tell them the same thing. I'm on for about nine, or ten, uh, nine out of ten days. Mm -hmm. I said, that's that one day that I'm not totally there, and I said, I hope you understand. So I said, Every, everybody's... In, we're not infallible, you know. We go out here and we work at it. And even on a bad day, we have to work a little bit more. That's exactly right. In nine out of 10 days, yes. in 1977, was the 10th day a dream come true for you or were you scared whenever you got traded to the Saint, from the Kansas City Royals to the St. Louis Cardinals? Well, <clears throat> no, not at all. You know, growing up in the <clears throat> Hill, Southeast Missouri, I feel right. like the Cardinals we have so many surrounding states that follow the Cardinals. Yes. I feel like the Cardinals are America's team. I might be biased, but right. you got traded to probably your favorite team as a child, right? Right. They had, uh, you know, they had the largest network. You would think the Yankees, Boston, Dodgers, whoever would have the bigger networks. But no, the Cardinals have the biggest network for radio anyway. And I think they still do. Uh, I'd have to do some checking on that. But, you know, I was in Montana my first year, and I had the little radio, and all of a sudden I hear Harry Carey, Jack Buck, you know, and I'm going, holy cow, you know, holy cow. There they are. Then I lost them. <laughs> but, you know, I, I did get them in Montana. And then being traded, it was se the, the winter of 75. It was December. So I went over there in 70. I mean, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're right. 77, yeah, I got traded. So 78 to 382, I was with the Cardinals. And uh, no, I wasn't. It didn't matter to me. And it was 30 minutes before the trading deadline. And the trading deadline, uh, it was in, the, the meetings were in Hawaii that year. So they called me late at night. So it wasn't much time to celebrate then? No, not really. It, you know, you're a little confused. You're not confused, but you are confused. And you're okay with it. Because if you're traded, hey, I'm still playing. You know, people say, what's it like to be traded? I said, well, you're still playing baseball. You know, you're still on a field. And 
you know, I expect to be a major league player and go to spring training and show my stuff. You're right, you were kind of a veteran at that time, so you knew the, bus the business of the game, but I'm sure it brought yeah. pride to the area and <clears throat> to your parents at the time, right. and that you were a St. Louis Cardinal. Right, well the one thing too is you gotta kinda downplay it and be a little bit humble about it. Mm -hmm. in, in baseball, as anything business, if you're not humble, you will be humbled. That's a pretty good thing to follow right there. You don't want to go out and say, hey, I'm really good. I say, no, you're not. There's a lot of other people out there that can uh, unseat you at any time. You know, you may have the best fastball. You may have the best slider. But, you know, you've got to go out there and understand there's, you're going to have your days just as well. So just try to be consistent. Well, you played for Whitey Herzog both yeah. for the Royals and the Cardinals. Right. So he must have really believed in your talent. Tell us a little bit about a little bit about the white rat. <clears throat> rat was great. You know, I talked to his son Jimmy. I might even see him. I might even see Whitey in St. Louis. He's 90 now. Mary Lou's right there with him, his wife. And uh, it's hard not to like Whitey. But the thing about Whitey is, is he's still a leader. So one thing he does, he just lets you play. There's no rah rah. He's not a rah rah guy. Pro, pro guys aren't generally rah rah guys. They go, hey, like that. <laughs> yeah. Back out. Uh, we, we're, let's, we do our job and we're, because we're expected to. They make a good catch. Oh, hey, great. You know, hey, good catch. You know, hey, nice hit. You know, uh, that's what you're, you're paid to do. So, you know, be professional about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some of the young guys that come up from the colleges where, you know, they've been, you know, turning the hats on backwards and all that. That does not exist anymore. Matter of fact, when I was coaching in rookie ball, which I love rookie ball, is uh, the very first game, those guys will be up there on the very top deck, and I'm sitting back there with my legs crossed. I say, gentlemen, I know you're college boys, you're pretty boys, sit down, I wanna watch the game. <laughs> and don't do this raw, raw crap, please. And so eventually, we have, my manager's gonna have that, and he's loving every word I'm saying. <laughs> you're doing the dirty work for him. I'm, I'm leading the path, leading the way, mm -hmm. right here. I said, hey, we've only got 140 something games here left versus 162. I said, so I don't intend to watch you stand up there in front of me and go, hey, <laughs> you know, <laughs> calm down. Now, Mark, were you in the 82 World Series? Yes. Did you get to pitch in the World Series? No, I was hurt. Matter of fact, I forgot my, where my ring in here, but I did get a ring out of it. I, I, I pitched in 16 games. <clears throat> my arm went, it just broke, basically. Because I'd went through an arm surgery earlier that really made me what I was. And then uh, I went to the big leagues, went to Puerto Rico. And I'd, I ended up throwing like 320 innings. It was, it was incredible, stupid. They didn't know that back then. They thought we were all through and we're supposed to survive. But you know, when you're throwing hard and you're throwing a hard slider and you know, you end up breaking a cardinal record or strikeout record, I'm not trying to strike people out. I'm just getting two strikes on the guys. Eh, here, I might as well make you sit down. You know, here. And then when you're throwing well, you, know, you kind of got an upper hand. You really do. You know, the first time I faced Aaron, for instance. You know, uh, Aaron was kind of interesting because I threw him a fastball and then Buck Martinez shot down a fastball sign and, and, I, and I paused. And then I went, and I didn't, I didn't nod my head or anything. And then I went into my windup, I said, crap. Because when I paused, I said, he knows what's coming. <laughs> and so I'm still throwing it, screw it. And the ball was right there and I'm, I'm throwing good. The ball was right there, and he hadn't even moved, and all of a sudden he moved, and those hands came out of nowhere, and he fouled it straight back, and I said, uh-uh, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> no mas. Lesson, lesson learned. No more. <laughs> yeah. And then the second time I faced him, he grounded out, but to second, he got did it on a slider, but quick hands. So, Mark, the Royals and the Cardinals are your teams. So yeah. They faced each other in the 85 World Series, I believe. Mm -hmm. Did you go to that World Series? I mean, were you torn on who to root for? No, nah, no, nah, I was just worn out. I was probably instructionally 
coaching. You'd already started your coaching career. Well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. How did it affect you mentally after your playing days were over, after you accepted it that I can't pitch anymore? So after you accepted that? Actually, you? I didn't go on to a field for five years. Other issues came into play. But then I really wanted to get back. I was, that's where I should have been. I actually worked for the Cardinals up in the front office for a month, maybe. And I, I'd done some things over in Kansas City for Ewing Kaufman. The owner had gotten me involved. And uh, he had a really nice big system working. And they drew very well, uh, the Royals did. And Gussie Bush, I spoke to Gussie when I was with the Cardinals and a group of businessmen down in the locker room. I was, I'm, I'm telling them about this, this, this thing, this system. They wanted to hear it, actually. And so I spoke. And, Lay this and he, oh, oh yeah oh, oh you know so yeah country boy <laughs> stuff like that your legacy lives on in the cardinals office oh, then. oh yeah well, mark let's talk about your invention because i think that is an awesome invention the nutty buddy yeah um how'd you wake up one day and say <clears throat> i'm going to save all these catchers lives from now they're going to get to continue to have kids well it wasn't only catchers because you know pitchers get the brunt of it too. Because line drive, you're when you, you when you throw a pitch in there and they hit it, and that ball's traveling two feet out in front of the plate, they hit it, and your stride and your you're 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 getting a pitch around 40, 54 uh, feet, where from here to here, and then you know, like you said, catchers, Yachty, where's my cup now? He should have in the first place. He wouldn't have got hurt. But uh, I came up with this when I was coaching with the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of eating my pitcher's butt out one day, just for having fun. We had some downtime. I said, hey, how many of you guys wear cups? Half of them raised their hand. I said, that's what I figured. And so I, I harp a little bit on it. And somebody from the back, and they said, hey, Lit. You know, Littell, Lit, our country. Lit, why don't you just go and invent one? I said, well, I think I will. So I went into the training room. I said, hey, has anybody got any golf balls? Somebody's got golf balls <laughs> you know, around. Yeah, I think I might have some in the bag. Here. Now, here's a couple, country. So I get the golf balls, I get the plastine, and I put it in the hydroculator. It waves at around four minutes, and then you get the big scissors out, and you put those two golf balls down, and I bent it like it should have been. And I came back out there the next day, and I said, hey, here's your cup. You know, and he said, that's pretty nice. He said, maybe you should patent that. I said, nah. There's nothing on it. Well, after the <clears throat> instruction league was over, I said, uh, called a friend of mine, Carter Fletcher, Carter Farm Farmer. So anyway, he's a Mizzou boy, smart. And I said, hey, you know any patent lawyers? He said, no, but I can find one for you in Kansas City. I said, okay. So he found this Japanese guy, and he told me, I said, well, how much does it cost? You know, and he said, well, for a patent search, it's around 600 bucks. I said, okay. And so he said, send it over, send, send a check, and I'll, I'll let you know in six, seven weeks. You know, it comes back, goes to Washington, and they do all the jazz. So he, he calls me, and he says, you know what? This is free and clear. And I said, okay, so what's that mean? He said, you spend more money. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> so... Anyway, uh, that cup ends up winning five awards, the only cup to ever win an award. And one was a design award, because they, anatomically, that's what I did was I made this anatomically correct. And that's the way I saw it, because I have a tail, a head in the, in the middle. And uh, I say this, I've said this before, but each testicle has its own little place to set. So it's... Confined. It's nice, and well, I have and I have five sizes. Well, I saw your demonstration. So yes. you actually kind of like hair club for men. You not only <laughs> yeah. remember, you actually used the product too. I stood behind my product. You did literally. Yes, you and, stood up straight. Yes, and you know people ask me. They say, "Well, why are you smiling there?" I said, "Because I'm seeing dollar signs are coming down." <laughs> so, how have sales been of Nutty Buddy? Where can you get Nutty Buddy right now? You get Nutty Buddy on uh, online. 
We were in the big box stores, but they have a tendency to chop your arms off, mm -hmm. you know, like dicks and stuff. And, uh, and they can't do you really justice because I've got a very high income. It's around 100 bucks for a setup because I, mean, I have patented shorts too. And they're patented, the uh, guy out of Canada, all the hockey players wear that short. And I've, wear the, I have a pair that I've got for six years. They haven't broken down at all. And then I put a jock strap with it, which kids don't, uh, well, I never wore a jock strap. I'm not gonna wear a jock strap. Well, okay, you're gonna get whacked, you know, and you're gonna lose something. And they don't get it. Well, you can't get any better endorsement than Yadier Molina, the best catcher to play baseball. There's a lot of, lot, of, lot of people, you know, it's just not for baseball, Barry. It's also uh, hockey, lacrosse is big. Uh, cricket is twice the size of baseball. Uh, umpires use my cup, unbelievably. But anyway, um, it's, it's rather interesting. And, I, and I got five sizes. Most have three. I have five, and I have a flex cup. Uh, MMA wears my cup, mixed martial arts. And uh, the guys that really do the stupid fighting, you know, where they let you bleed to death, uh, they, they wear it. Five sizes are hammer, boss, hog, trophy, and mongo. And that's how they sell. And there's a sizing chart and the whole nine yards. Well, one size definitely doesn't fit all. It's exactly right. But every eighth grader wants a mongo. I'm sure. <laughs> so. Well, Mark, you, you're a farmer first. Then you're a baseball player, author of books, inventor. Yeah. But you're really back home to help the veterans this weekend. Yeah, big so deal. Let's talk about the Wake Foundation. So how long have you been involved with that? Oh, around five years now, actually. Robert uh, Wake had saw me over at the hospital with the veterans, and uh, he had asked me to come over. I had not met him yet, and I started you know, meeting the, the veterans. I, I go to their rooms in the VA hospitals, and then uh, the, hosp the homes as well. And I don't just shake hands and say, hey, how you doing? I say, hey, I'm Mark Tell. How you doing? I used to play for the Cardinals, and you know, I'll wear this, and I'll give them a card, and uh, they, they like that, and then I'll, I'll ask them and talk, and if they want to talk, that's fine. If they don't, it's fine too, but I, I make my rounds. So tell us about the Wake <clears throat> Foundation, though. It's, uh, they raise money for veterans. <clears throat> right. We, and t just give us a little bit of history about Wake Foundation. They, uh, they, I think they're around 11 years right now. They have, they're in nine different states. Uh, the helping part, helping wounded veterans, is he'll put them on you know, kayak things. He'll send them to Washington, D.C. to see all the monuments and things of that nature, the honor, honor team. They'll charter a flight out there. Well, I can tell it's near and dear to your heart. I know you love yeah. helping the veterans in the area. Well, my dad got shot up. I saw what he went through. <clears throat> Thank goodness my mom was a nurse. She was a nurse for 53 years, but you know, the PSTD, they called it way something different there. You know, uh, it wasn't called PSTD at the time. But my brother and I witnessed that. And you do grow out of, I guess, when you get older a little bit, you know, but they have a much better help to nowadays than what they did back then. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's big time needed. Well, Mark, we appreciate you coming by and visiting with us today. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to have you back home here and come back and see us sometime. Barry, I've enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Mark Littell, ladies and gentlemen, he's an icon here in Southeast Missouri with the Cardinals and Royals organization. And Mark, your fans here in Southeast Missouri, you still have a bunch of them. I'll give you the last word. <clears throat> I'm more than happy to be back here anytime. Uh, I enjoy the people. I enjoy the lay of the land even. It's just wonderful. This, this land. Everybody said, well, how can you get used to that? Well, because it's green, it's growth, and the, and the, and the people vibrate, you know, they're energized from the whole thing. And they're wonderful people, they're down to earth, and, uh, you know, glory be to God as well. And the main so, thing, Mark, it's home. It is home. Once again, thanks, Mark, for being here today.